Good evening, everyone. Back for another session, <laughs> hopefully. I hope you're all wide awake because it is the evening and it's the end of the week, so people are kind of tired. Um, I'm going to try to make this a shorter session tonight uh, because I think I'm going to split this up into two parts. Uh, rather than trying to jam all the goodies into one evening, I think I'll probably separate into two evenings. So this will be a part one and a part two. So I encourage you that if you, if you started the journey here for part one, come back for part two. Um, we're starting, we've started a series on walking with Jesus. And if you recall, although it seems like it was so long ago because I don't speak every week, but we began this journey with three different uh, messages that we had. The first one was waiting out winter, which all of these you can find online, on our website or on YouTube. Then we had the holiness of hiddenness, how Jesus spent 90% of his life in hidden places, in secret. We talked about that. And then our last session was on choices and chapters, how your choices and my choices write like the chapters of our lives, how, how important our choices are in life. So those are the three ones that we walked through. But tonight I wanted to take a little uh, year off, take a little rest stop, from the journey, and I want to talk about two foundational truths that are so crucial and critical to the life of the child of God, that if we don't have this down, then we can't even build anything on top of that. So I really want, and one is kind of a review, which I covered uh, a couple, a few months ago, but another one is a new one. So it's, that's why I'm saying it's going to be a two-part tonight. We'll continue it next week. But... It occurred to me that there's two <coughs> foundational truths that are the most important things that we could ever share with one another and with the world. And for me personally, the most important message I ever had the privilege to share was a message called First Love, Coming Back to Jesus. Some of you are nodding your head you remember it. And again, that's a video that's online. First Love, Return to Your First Love. That is the most important message I think I could ever, ever share. Of all the wonderful topics there are in the Word of God, there's none more important than the love of God for you. That's the most important message that we can share. So truth number one, the foundation I'm laying tonight, and I'll continue next week with truth number two, is that He first loved me. Very, very simple. Very, very simple, but a lot of us know it mentally. But... We don't live it out in our hearts every day, knowing that He first loved me. And that's what I'm going to build on tonight, on that truth. On first love, coming back to Jesus. We used this slide once before, several months ago, in that message. If you get a chance to tune into that message, because I can't cover all the points tonight that I did then, but it's a wonderful message on what does it mean that you have left your first love. What does it mean to come back to your first love? Mm -hmm. And it might be a little different than what you think, because the Lord gave me a little different angle, a little different viewpoint on it than what I've normally heard preached. So I think it'll be a blessing to you if you turn, tune in. But the power of returning to your first love, it's the, as I said before, it's the most important message I could ever share. It's the most important message you could ever receive. And it's the most important message that your life could ever reflect to other people. There is no more important message than knowing that He first loved me. That's where it all starts. That's why Jesus came. You ha we have to have that down before we build anything. That is the gospel in a nutshell. That He first loved me. He loved me so much that He left His glory and His throne in heaven just to come for me. And if you were the only person, he would have come just for you. You know, everyone quotes that verse, John 3, 16, we all know it. For God so loved the world, but God so loved you. We all know that God loved the world. We know about his universal love. But somehow, we don't know it personally. For God so loved me. That love has to become your own. You have to experience it, not just a universal love that God has for the world, but God so loved me. 
So that's my goal tonight, as if you stick on the journey with me, that the love will become personal to you, and not just a universal love. Love is the only message. And why do I say that? Because even God's word says, perfect love casts out fear. God's love casts out fear, casts out torment, casts out anxiety. And we live in a very tormented world. Don't we? The world is tormented by so much anxiety, so much worry, so much um, anxiousness. So it's only God's love. The word says God's love, perfect love, casts out fear. His love is the most important and the most transformative message that you and I could ever receive. And it's the reason Jesus came for you and me. Jesus came to rescue me. He came to restore me, to restore the relationship. He came to rescue, to restore the relationship, the broken relationship that we had with the Father. It was a broken relationship. So Jesus came for that very purpose, not to judge us, but to rescue us and to restore us to relationship. Remember the three R's. Rescue, restore, to relationship. That's why Jesus came. Jesus was broken. His body was fractured so that my fractured relationship with a loving Heavenly Father could be mended. Jesus was broken so that I could be healed and mended. So that's that is the message, really. What greater message is there? There's so many wonderful topics to talk about in the Word of God, but what greater message is there than that? And what more life-transforming message is there than His love? So the Lord brought me back to this this week. And this is my number one message, I think, in all my life that I could probably ever have the privilege to share. It's about His love. And next week will be my number two message, and I'm not going to say that as a surprise. But he first loved me. His love transforms. But I want, I want to give you some verses about that. I want to linger on his love tonight. Because it's so delicious, his love. I don't want to speed through it. I want to linger on it. 1 John 2, verse 15 and 16. Probably familiar with this verse. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And the next verse goes on to say, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. There's a lot of ofs. You see that word of? Mm -hmm. That little two-letter two letter word of is so repeated so much in these two verses. That of is all over the place in this verse. But the of that I want to focus in on, which is supremely important, is right here. Anyone who loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Notice how it does not say the love for the Father is not in him. The love of the Father. Very, very significant. A little word, but very significant. People go into the world not because they don't love God enough. That's what often the church tells us. You've got to love God more. You've got to love God more. People go into the world because they don't love God. No, people go into the world because the love of the Father, the Father's love, is not unveiled in them, is not revealed to them. People go into the world, frankly, because they don't know how deeply they're loved, how unconditionally they're loved. The love of the Father. The Father's love is not in them. Not their love for the Father, but the Father's love for them is not in them. It's not revealed in them. And so they go to all these other things. And you know, I lived most of my life, and I never saw that about this verse. That one little word, of, gives a whole different slant to that verse. It's not that they didn't love God that they went into the world. It's because the Father's love was not in that, revealed to them. So it's a whole different slant than I ever saw before. I want to give you another verse on love. Actually, two verses, which you're so familiar with, I'm sure. 1 John chapter 4, here's verse 10. 
And here's part of verse 19. This is love, right? Not that we loved God, but that He loved us. And He sent His Son to be the atonement for our sins. And then He skips ahead. In, in verse 19, nine verses later, He says, we love Him. Why? Because He first loved us. And we're going to linger on this word first loved for a little while. It's so significant, this word first. For most of my life, I just kind of read over that word. But that word is so significant, first love, in that verse, to understand how we love. But I want to read this in its context. Pastor Joaquin is always a big proponent. He's always telling us we have to take verses and read them in their whole context so we can get the full meaning. We just don't pick a verse out, but reading it in its context gives you the full meaning of it. So let's read this verse in its context. 1 John 4, 16 through 21. And there's so much richness in this that I'm going to even linger on this for a while. There's so much in here. Verse 16. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Let's stop right here. There's nothing more important in your life or in my life than knowing and believing. Did you notice that it wasn't, and we have known the love? It's not enough to just know that God loves me. It's not enough to just know that God loves me. We have known and believed. A lot of people say, yeah, I know God loves me. But there's a difference between knowing and believing. Mm -hmm. Believing takes it to a deeper level. Believing, that's the word pistis that Pastor often talks about in Greek. It's the trusting. It's the, it's the absolute trust and confidence in a loving God. So it's not enough just to know God loves you. Do you believe it? Do you have absolute trust in that love? It's essential. Let's go on. This is how our love is made perfect and complete. So that we may have boldness, assurance, and confidence in the day of accusation and condemnation. Because as he is, so are we in this world. And you know what I got from this little verse? I wrote a note here. The very basis for your confidence and your defense in the day of accusation, in the day of condemnation, rests upon your belief that God loved you. You see the connection between the basis for your confidence, the basis for your assurance, is the fact that He loves you. You can have no confidence without knowing that you are loved unconditionally. That is the basis for your confidence. What? In the day of condemnation. There will be days, moments, and hours in your life when you will feel shame, guilt, and condemnation. The basis for your boldness in those days, your defense, my defense in those days, is the knowledge of how perfectly we're loved. We are not perfect people in our behaviors, but we are perfectly loved. And that's the basis for our confidence. You must know that. And then verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect and complete love casts out fear. That word perfect in the Greek, by the way, means complete, mature love. Casts out fear, because fear has torment. But he who fears has not been made mature or perfect in love. You know, we often quote this. There's a sister in our church who loves to quote this. She's always speaking it to her little grandchildren. She's always telling them to say, because as he is, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. She loves that statement. And you know what dawned on me? If you look at that statement in its context, do you realize that you are never more like Jesus than when you are walking in the awareness of his love for you? Mm -hmm. That's what that means. We are never more like Jesus than when, when we know how deeply loved we are. As he is, so are we. It's connected to his love. And then this portion ends with, 
the verse that we're focusing on tonight. We love him because he first loved us. So I want to take you to a quick review of what I did several months ago. I want to look at a church who forgot that. They forgot how deeply loved they were. Do you remember the Ephesian church? We talked about the church in Ephesus. In the book of Revelation, in chapter 2, it mentions that the Ephesian church suffered a fall. They fell. Now, it was not a moral fall. It wasn't a character failure. It was not a doctrinal error or a lack of faith. It was none of those things. It was not a failure to do good works. Nevertheless, we're going to see that they suffered a fall. It was a more serious fall. And all of those things that I just mentioned, there are moral failures, there are doctrinal failures, there are faith failures. But this church in Ephesus suffered a more serious fall than any type of character or moral fall that you can think of. And that's where I'm going to take you to. Let's read it in Revelation 2, if you're familiar, the Holy Spirit is addressing seven churches. He's giving a message to the seven churches in Revelation. And so he starts out here, and we're going to look at Ephesus only tonight, because that's the church that fell. I want you to see how they fell. They fell because they forgot something. So forgetting leads to falling. So I want you to see what they forgot. This is the Holy Spirit speaking. Inspired, John is inspired. Write a letter to the leader of the church at Ephesus and tell him this. These are the words of the one who holds firmly the leaders of the seven churches in his right hand and who walks among the seven churches. Now, this is what he said to them. I know your hard work, your toil, your labor, and your patience. I know you don't tolerate sin among your members, and you have carefully tested and examined the claims of those who say they are apostles, but are not. And you have found them out to be liars and impostors. He goes on. Look at this church. They're doing everything right. You have patiently endured. And for my name's sake, you have worked hard to the point of weariness and fatigue, yet without fainting or quitting. Now here comes the butt. Where the bottom's going to fall out. <laughs> We're getting to it. But I have this one charge against you. Because you have left your first, best love. Remember the heights from which you are fallen. That word fallen, in a few slides later, I'm going to take you to what that is. But that word fallen means to drop away, to be driven off course, to lose, to become inefficient and of no effect. He's telling them, remember the heights you have fallen and repent. And if you come to this church, you know what repent means. Metanoia it means to change your mind. It doesn't mean to run to the altar and weep repeatedly. It means to change your mind. The Holy Spirit is telling you, change your mind and your old way of thinking. And turn back to me again. And do the first works when you first knew me. First love. Passionate love. Exciting love. Or else I will come and remove your church and its impact from its place among the churches, unless you repent. Very serious, very sober. And yet when you look at it, they were doing all the right behaviors. All the right, this was not a lazy church, this was not a compromising church, this was not a half-hearted, half-baked church. They were laboring for the Lord to the point of weariness and exhaustion. And yet, they suffered a fall. It wasn't a, an a action of sin. It wasn't a moral fall. It was a more serious fall. And so I want to take you to that word we were talking about uh, first here. 
Here we are in Revelation. We just read, read this. And he's talking to the Ephesian church. And he says, you have left your first love. Now, does that sound familiar? We just read 1 John 4, 19, which says we love him. Why? Because he first loved us. So I want you to see the connection between the church in Ephesus, where they left their first love, and we love him because he first loved us. What's the connection then? The connection is a Greek word. It's the same Greek word in both instances, protos. And that word means first, before, and best. Foremost in time, place, order, and importance. So you might say, okay, so what, what does that mean to me? This is what this means. This is why that word is so beautiful. Because protos, he first loved me. Do you know what that means to you? It means God put loving me first before and foremost in his time, place, and order of importance. You always were and you still are God's priority. That's what's so beautiful about he first loved us. He first, he protosed us. He put us first in his heart, first in his thoughts, first in his order of importance. You're his priority. And the Ephesian church forgot that. He never wanted to exhaust them and use them. As a child of God, God's intention is never to exhaust you and use you and burn you out. His desire is to love you. He first loved you. He protosed you. That word protos is so rich. You're first. Think about it. In all of his God's priorities, you are loving you is first in his heart and mind. So how did the Ephesians fall? Like I said before, we often think of, of a fall when we say, oh, so-and-so fell from grace. The first thing that comes to our minds is we think of um, acts of sin, we think of some deep, dark, moral failure. That's what we think of when we say someone fell. But I want you to see how the Ephesians fell. They missed the mark. Not in their doctrine, not in their moral behaviors, because they were blameless in that area. But they missed the mark in their awareness of Christ's love for them, which in turn produces intimacy with them. Do you know you can be doing all the right things and have no intimacy with Christ whatsoever? All the right behaviors. You can be going to church every week, tithing, mm -hmm. uh, going out, handing out tracts, door to door, doing good works, uh, feeding the poor. You can be doing all the right things and have no intimacy with the one for whom you are doing it for. That's what happened to the Ephesians. That was a fall. They fell. It's only in your, when you're aware of how much you're loved is when you will love in return, when you will have intimacy with him, you have to know how much you're loved. Oops, it's wrong. The Ephesians did not live out of his love for them, but rather they lived by their works for him. And that's why they fell. Do you know so much of the church today, so much emphasis on getting people to live the right way, getting people to love God more, getting people to be more passionate about Christ, rather than spending time getting people to know how deeply they're loved. That's a major problem in the church today. We're so caught up trying to get people to love God more, being more passionate for Jesus, rather than revealing the heart of the Father to people, which in turn produces that intimacy. We put the cart before the horse with that. So it's in it's important, it's crucial, that I must return to the awareness of his love every single day. The message of his unconditional love is something I have to hear every single day in my life. This is not a one-time message. Oh yeah, I heard that message uh, six, six months ago. I, no, you have to hear this and get it into you mm -hmm. every mm -hmm. single day. Mm -hmm. 
Why? Because we live in a hostile world mm -hmm. where everything in this world is telling you you're not loved, you're not good enough, you don't measure up. God is not for you. God is somehow against you or displeased with you. There's pressures from within, in my own mind, and there's pressures from without. So everything in this world is geared to tell us we're not loved. We need to hear this over and over and over again. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing by the Word of God. It's not a one-time hearing. I, sometimes I, I laugh to myself because I hear people say, oh yeah, I read the Bible. <laughs> like it's just something you read once. Oh, yeah, I read the Bible. No. Faith comes by the continual hearing yeah. of the Word of God. Even so, you have to have a continual awareness of His love for you. You can never hear the message of His love too many times. It never gets stale. It never gets old. It's the very words by which we live. So, we know about the Ephesians, but I want to take you to another church tonight. They weren't alone in their fallen state. There's another church who Pastor Joaquin mentions from time to time. The church in Galatia was also in danger of a fall because they were tempted to return back to the practice of circumcision and they wanted to embrace that ritual in order to fulfill the law and maintain their righteousness. So there's a parallel between the church in Ephesus, who forgot, and now we're going to look at the church in Galatia. Look at the admonishment that Paul gives to the church in Galatia. Very, very strong. Galatians 5.4, look what he says. Remember, they want to go back to circumcision. They want to fulfill the law and maintain their righteousness through the works of the law. And this is what he says to them. Christ has become useless to you. Whoever of you are justified by the law, you are, there's that word, fallen. You see the fall? Just like the Ephesians. You are fallen from grace. I remember Pastor saying, the law is down here. Grace is here. Grace is higher than the law. You fall from grace. You don't fall from the law. You fall from grace. Grace is above the law. He says you are fallen from grace. See the parallel? Here's Galatia, the church in Galatia. Here's the Ephesians. Remember what he said to them. Remember the heights from which you are fallen. And repent. Two churches. The parallel. What's the connection between these two churches? It's this word fallen, fallen, fallen. The Greek word ekipto in Greek literally means to drop away, to be driven off course, to become inefficient and of no effect. Think about that. Think about the strongness of this word. He's saying Christ has become useless to you. You are fallen. That's the common denominator between these two passages and these two churches. And think about it. All the Ephesians did was to forget. The most important thing, they forgot and they suffered a fall. Which is why I say, forgetting leads to falling. It's so important that we don't forget how deeply we're loved, that we don't forget the truths of God's Word, that we don't forget the promises of God's Word, that we don't forget our inheritance. Because as we begin to forget, we begin to fall. Forgetting and falling are linked. Return to your first work, oh, excuse me, to your first love. Again, speaking of the Ephesians, their passion for good works eclipsed their awareness of his passion for them. They were more caught up in their passion. I want, I love Jesus, I love, you know, I often hear Christians talk about how much they love the Lord, how much they love Jesus, and it's well-intentioned. But I want you to see the subtlety of this. The Ephesians were caught up in their passion for good works, in their passion to serve God in their passion to please God, that that actually eclipsed their awareness of His passion for them. 
which is far more important than my passion could ever be. His passion for you is so far more greater than your passion for him could ever be. Their focus was wrong. And because their focus was wrong, they suffered a fall. Very different than what we normally associate with a fall, right? When we say someone's fallen from grace, we think they fell into adultery or they fell into uh, a drug addiction. When we say they fell, in, fell from grace, we think of sin, acts of sin. Very, very different falling from grace here. Return to your first work, love. Their first work, the Ephesians, remember he said to them, the Holy Spirit was crying out to them, return to your first works. What was their first work? What does that mean? Their first work was to know his love mm -hmm. and to live it out their lives through the power of his love. You and I live not on our own steam. We don't live through our own works and our own steam and our own strength. We live through the power of his love. Remember, it's his love that casts out all worry and anxiety and torment. We live through the power of his love. It's the increasing awareness of God's love for you that will increase your intimacy with him. When I hear people say, oh, I wish I could love God more. I wish I could get closer to Jesus. It's very simple. Start focusing, start learning about how much he loves you. When you are aware of how deeply you are loved, your intimacy with him will grow. You don't have to work at it, strive at it, work it up. No, focus on how deeply you're loved and your intimacy with Just, It's a natural byproduct. It's a natural fruit. That's the problem with Christians. They're trying to work up a love for God. i got to love God more. I've heard, I can't tell you how many times I've heard Christians say that. Oh, I pray for me that I will love God more. No, I'm going to pray for you that you become more aware of how deeply you're loved. Because when you're aware of how deeply you're loved, you will love God more. That's where the intimacy comes out. Yeah. I got this line right? Yes. This slide, I'm going to tell you something funny about this slide. Of all the things that I've shared, I've gotten the most feedback about this one little statement. It's like a little Sunday school child statement. And I got so much feedback from this. Maybe because it's so easy to remember, but people love this statement. What is first love? Simply, Jesus loved me first, and Jesus loves me best. I've gotten more feedback about that one little sentence than anything else that I've shared. Because it's so simple, a child can understand it. I mean, it almost sounds like a little Sunday school song. It's so simple, a child can grasp it. And when you realize the children loved coming to Jesus, and Jesus loved the children, the truths of God's word, that's how the truths of God's word should be to you. It shouldn't be something complicated and complex and hard to understand. It should be something that a child can grasp it. Jesus loved me first. If you don't remember anything else tonight, remember, Jesus loved me first, and Jesus loves me best. And then you got it. That's what first <laughs> love means. <laughs> you can ignore everything else I said. It's really that simple. So I'm going to close in a, in a minute or two, but I'm going to give you a little, uh, little uh, peek into next week, into part two. Because this truth that I am first loved is truth number one, and it leads me into the second truth, which is the key to transformation. That's another thing that Christians struggle with. How come I can't change? I want to change. I want to be more like Christ. What's the key to transformation? I'm going to make a shocking statement to you tonight. Self-improvement techniques are a complete waste of time without the following foundational truth from God's Word. I don't care what program you go through, what kind of techniques you use, it's an utter waste of time without this foundation in your life. And this is the truth we're going to delve into more next week. By beholding, we become. Beholding God's glory. Beholding and becoming. 
Beholding causes me to become. Not my efforts, not techniques. By beholding we become. I have to get to know what God wants me to know. You have to know what God wants you to know. And many well-meaning believers are ignorant of what God wants them to know. You have to know who you are. You have to know your identity in Christ. And I'm going to give you a little, I'm going to go a little bit more, just a few minutes here. You know how I know people don't know who they are in Christ? And I'm talking about Christians. I'm not even talking about unbelievers in the world. I'm talking about children of God, really sincere believers. You know how I know they don't know who they are? Because I'm going to throw out a statement to you. I know you've heard it 50 million times. Ever hear the saying, I'm just a sinner saved by grace? I've heard that since I was a little girl. Oh, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. It sounds very spiritual, doesn't it? I'm just a sinner. It sounds very humble. It sounds very spiritual. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Bad theology. Wrong, wrong, wrong. You're not just a sinner saved by grace. You are no longer a sinner saved by grace. That's who you once were. Mm -hmm. You are not just a sinner saved by grace. That expression, that sentence should never be part of a child of God's vocabulary. Scratch it out of your vocabulary. Mm -hmm. That's who you once were. I am no longer that person. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to prove that to you scripturally. I am a new creation Amen. in Christ. The old me no longer exists. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So therefore, you have no right and I have no right to go around saying, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Totally unscriptural. Diminishing and minimizing the work of the cross when you say that. It sounds humble and it sounds spiritual, but it's not. Leave the past in the past. I borrowed a, a, a slide from our prayer booklet. We developed a prayer booklet for our prayer team here at Pure Grace. And I borrowed this page out of our booklet because it's so important to leave the past in the past. And I want to read this scripture to you. If you read our prayer booklet in church, you saw it. I want you to see the difference between the past and the present. And that's where a lot of Christians get hung up. They can't distinguish between the past of what once was and the present which what now is. Look at Hebrews 10, 4, 14, excuse me. Jesus has, past tense, past tense, Jesus has perfected for all time them that are, are, present tense. You see the past tense and you see the present tense. Them that are sanctified. Let's look at the present tense. But you are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified. Not I will one day be. You are. Not future tense. Present tense. In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. And I missed the number here. That should be 1 Corinthians 6.11. The problem... Uh, I want to read this before I make that statement. I want to read it again in its context. Look at these verses in verse 12. It's the context here of Hebrews. But this man, speaking of Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. For by one offering, he has perfected, past tense, forever, them that are sanctified, present tense. And then this is how this context ends. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Beautiful, beautiful. The problem with many sincere Christians is that they don't know the difference between what forever and what is no more. They get confused. 
You have to know what was done forever, and you have to know what's no more. You are no more a sinner saved by grace. Know the difference between forever and no more. That's what, that's, you have to know what Jesus made you and who you are. And that's the problem with Christians today. They confuse forever with no more. I want to give you another statement. How about the saying, Christians are not perfect, just forgiven. I've seen that bumper sticker all over the place. Christians aren't perfect, they're just forgiven. Bad theology. What does it say? Jesus has perfected for all time them that are sanctified. That word perfect does not mean perfect in your actions or behavior. It means completed. So don't go around saying, well, Christians aren't perfect, they're just forgiven. No, you are perfect. According to Scripture, you have been perfected. You have been completed. You have been finished for all time. See, these are the little things that it's subtle, but it's little things that we buy into because they sound spiritual, and they sound right, but they're really not right. So next week when I continue, I'm going to go into and address, okay, well, if Jesus has perfected me for all time, and I'm washed and I'm sanctified and justified, then why do I still struggle? Why do I still find myself in selfish attitudes, with sinful flesh, if Jesus already did it, why am I so struggling? That's what we're going to get into in the second powerful truth that sets us free from that. By beholding, you become. And I'm going to end there tonight because I don't want to crowd you too much and I'm going to continue that next week, okay? Tonight I want you to just grasp the truth of how deeply you're loved. You were loved first. You, you are first in God's heart, first, first on His mind, His first and top priority. Without that truth at work in your life, you will never have permanent victory. You will never live in ongoing victory. And you can't build on top of anything else other than that foundation of how deeply you're loved. Unconditionally, just the way you are. Next week, we're going to build on that and we're going to discover how we become transformed simply by beholding Him. Not by trying harder, not by striving harder, not by even self-discipline, but by simply beholding Him. And I'm going to give you the scriptures to prove that, how you become transformed simply by beholding Him. Okay, so I hope you tune in next week with that. I'm going to close in prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father for how deeply and how richly you love us. I pray, Lord, that every day we will become more aware of how deeply we are loved. Lord, that's the most important truth that we can really grasp because that's the whole reason you sent your son Jesus. It was a father's heart of love. So, Lord, tonight it was such a simple message. Jesus loved me first and Jesus loves me best. It may be simple, but it's the whole foundation of salvation. It's the whole reason for the cross. So, Lord, let us get that in us and prepare our hearts to receive the Word of God even next week on how we can change and be transformed. I thank you, Lord, for your love. In Jesus' name, amen.